Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Minneapolis St. Paul International Film Festival. My name is Jesse Bishop, the programming director for the festival. We're celebrating 40 years, and we're glad you're here with us for this special conversation around the feature film, o Oaxaca, California, The Return. I'm delighted to be joined by director Trisha Ziff and one of the film's stars, Vanessa, v Vanessa Mejia. Thank you both for being here and welcome. Thank you. Well, Trisha, you've crafted such a lovely documentary portrait. And um, I wonder if you could just start by letting us know when you first met the Mejias, because this is a, a project that you've been working on for a very long time. Well, that gives away my age, Jesse. So um, because Vanessa wasn't even even a sparkle in his father's eye when I, when I first met the Mejias. The film is actually called Oaxaca, California. So it's a play on words with Oaxaca and California to deal with that, uh, the relationship of the, of the migrant journey, if you like. But anyway, so um, I was many, many years ago, I was married to a Mexican photographer, Pedro Meyer. And um, Pedro got this job for the National Geographic to photograph um, uh, Mexico and the United States from his perception in relation to the 500th anniversary that was taking place. So I accompanied him to the Mixteca region in, in, in Oaxaca, uh, the Mixteca Alta, and at, at that time, Mixtec was much more prevalent as a language. And we traveled from Pueblo to Pueblo with different archaeologists from National Geographic. And um, we were in this one Pueblo and there was this family walking down the street and they were speaking in English. And um, I was like, oh, my God, I wonder I wonder what their story is. So I began chatting with them. And it was uh, Vanessa's grandparents, her father and her two aunts. And so we began to chat and they were lovely, warm, warm uh, people to us. And for me, it was just like I didn't hadn't been in Mexico very long. I didn't speak much Spanish. And here was people I could speak to in English. So I kind of latched myself onto the Mejia family. And then after the fiesta and Pedro had finished photographing, um, we went back. We lived in California then and they went back to Fresno, me to L.A. And I contacted them and because they'd invited me to stay with them. So I went and I stayed with the, them in Fresno and I had this idea that their story would make a great doc. So I asked them if they would be interested. I wasn't a filmmaker. I didn't direct the first version of Oaxaca. California, a very close friend of mine in London did, and I worked on it and produced it. And so we made the first film. We made the first film with two extraordinary cinematographers. One was Mario, uh, Mario uh, Hoya, Garcia Hoya Maito, who's probably of his generation, the most famous Cuban cinematographer, and Seamus McGarvey, who has a massive career today. Seamus was just out of art school. And uh, we filmed in film and we filmed in, in, uh, in video, old video. And, and we never forgot the experience. It was wonderful. I kept in touch with the Mejias over the years, weddings, births, Christmas, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think one year in 25 years has gone by where Vanessa, your grandpa, didn't call me and sing Las Mañanitas to me down the phone on my birthday every year for oh. all these years. And so we were very close. And I was with Seamus. He was shooting a film in uh, Brooklyn about five years ago, and we were having a drink together. I was shooting my last Witkin and Witkin, and he said, you know, it's a really good idea to go back to the Mejias and film with the new generation, with Vanessa's generation. And he had kept in touch with Vanessa's dad, Noe, on Facebook all these years. So the Mejias had followed his career. And very generously, the Mejias said yes. So that was the beginning of Oaxaca, California, the return. So the films go over 25 years. It's, uh, 
it's a big story, a long, long time to get to where we are today. Yeah, and you've captured it so perfectly in, in, in this film. Um, Vanessa, I, um, I wanna hear your experience, of course, about you know, the making of the film and your reaction to the film, but mm -hmm. I also wanted to ask before that, um, had you seen the original um, film about your, your parents and your grandparents? Well, um, actually, before I, I ever had even met Trisha, I, I had no idea my dad had even been a part of the film. So one day he comes to me and he says, you know, you don't know who this is because um, we went to a wedding and that was the first time I ever met Trisha. And then he begins to tell me about this documentary he was in. And I was so surprised I'd never heard of it and I definitely never seen it. Um, so the first time I actually saw it was a while after that. And I was about maybe 12, 13. So yeah, it was definitely really interesting to hear about it and it was amazing to see it. Well, there's the lovely scenes toward the beginning of the film where um, the family's watching the old footage. And um, I wonder if you could share a little bit about how that felt to watch, you know, as an entire family. Yeah, that was the first time we had all seen it together. And it was, it was so nice to just sit with my family and watch this archive of our past that most of us hadn't seen yet. Um, and it was interesting to see my siblings' reactions and all of our reactions. You know, you always wonder how your parents were when they were younger. So to actually have a film of your father and your tias and your grandparents when they were younger, it's, it's really special. And then to, to hear my grandparents' perspectives and, you know, my dad's perspective on his identity and their migration here, it's, um, it's really invaluable, you know, just to have that and to be able to share that with the world. So it was wonderful to get to watch it all together and to get to reminisce with them too. Well, your, your family is so you know, articulate and um, in, sh in expressing, you know, how you feel and your feelings and thoughts on, you know, identity and, and um, the complexities of your, your family history. Um, and you also in the film, you know, sh share um, much about that and very beautifully. Um, I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that, you know, that identity aspect and, um, and what it was like, you know, hearing, your, your grandparents' perspectives and how you sort of take that in and, and reconcile it with your own? Yeah, well, I think part of um, being the descendant of people who migrated here to America, there's always a lot of pressure. There's a lot of pressure to um, hold on to your identity, but also to make that sacrifice worth it. And sometimes, you know, to make that sacrifice worth it, you have to let go of some aspects of your identity to fit in. Um, that's what it feels like at times, you know, and I think a lot of people can relate to that feeling, that feeling of always being in between having to make compromises on your identity. And thankfully, I have come to the conclusion that you really don't have to do that. You know, it's important to hold on to your identity. And um, I think hearing my father's thoughts back then, hearing him say that he is Mexican and American, it was really validating to me because um, growing up in predominantly white spaces, I sometimes I felt really alienated. And I guess it's, it's good to know that you always have a community that understands what you're going through in your own family, um, at school, or um, in the workplace, everywhere. Yeah. That's great. And Trisha, you um, and so beautifully, you know, evoke this from the Mejia family and especially the new generation. Um, was that part of your intention as you, as you came back to the family? 
Um, or was a lot of these idea notions of identity and, and tensions around that um, come out organically? Well, for me, the motive behind making the, this version of the film uh, was my was a response in a way to Trump in 2015 when he made these heinous comments about Mexicans. And well, obviously I was as uh, I found it as obscene as as most people um, thinking, caring people found it obscene. And but here was this family that I, had a long history with, even though I live in Mexico, you can hear I'm, I am culturally uh, of, of England. I mean, I made Mexico my home many years ago, I, but I would never describe myself as Mexican. Um, and uh, so here was this family I was very close to, who I felt hurt for, I felt offended for by these, these comments. And, and knowing who they were and everything, it motivated me to, to make the film and also to have the voice of this new generation because there are so many films about migration there are so many films where we see the frontera, where we see the, the wall uh, in Tijuana, that it becomes kind of a bit of a cliche. And all we hear from the first generation, but there's very few times where we hear the voices of the second generation. Um, in a way, I wish the film, you know, in retrospect, um, had more of, uh, of their voices in it. Um, you know, we put a camera in front of someone and Vanessa's very articulate, but you know, some of her, co her cousins and her, her, sim her siblings um, was, you know, it was harder for, and they didn't know me and all of those things. But I think it's very unique. And I think Vanessa's voice really matters. It really matters today. And, and, I will always think of this film now as our COVID film. You know, it was edited and made uh, during lockdown. I never sat with my editor. Everything was done virtually. And there were things missing from the film and we needed to find ways to, um, to bridge those spaces with voice over. And so Vanessa and her dad and her aunt did quite a lot of the voiceover virtually from Fresno. In the past, I would have gone, I'd have gone back, would have recorded it, would have filmed it, and uh, but we couldn't. So Vanessa wrote some of her, what she says in the film. She reflected on it. She said it a million times. Poor Vanessa, I'm sorry about that. And, you know, and we downloaded it and we did it like that. And so I think for me, I'm so glad that Vanessa, this is the first time we talk about the film to any festival. Um, I'm so glad it's Vanessa that's here because for me, it's her film. It's yes, it's the whole families and the generations film, but she is the future and, and her voice is extraordinary and articulate and moving. And, and so having her, I think gives the film a strength. I couldn't agree more, um, Vanessa, that um, hearing your, you know, commentary and reflections throughout the film is, um, it really gives it a, um, that much more backbone, you know, um, a through line. And um, especially your, your commentary towards the end where you say you can't ignore, you know, who you are and, um, and you could never choose. Um, and that's, that's so simply, you know, put, but yet, and and so beautifully articulated, Tricia too, through the images and in the in the, the moments that you stitch together. Vanessa, what was it like watching the film for the first time and um, seeing you know your family, of course, and 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 hearing your words? And can you reflect on that? They did it on Oscar yeah. night, Jesse. By the way, sorry to interrupt, uh, Vanessa, <laughs> but it was so wonderful. And, and, and Vanessa's aunt, they did it in her house and they took a big plastic tablecloth and cut it in two and they made a red carpet and right. they, all, they all walked into the house and they took lots of pictures 
And then they watched it and then we had a Zoom. Sorry, Vanessa, I just had to say that because it was so brilliant. It was just great. <laughs> no, thank you for saying that. It was, it was really fun. Um, Sounds like it was in true Mejia style. Yeah, yeah, for <laughs> sure. We made it in events. Um, yeah, seeing that film for the first time with everyone, I think we were all a little nervous because we wondered, what did we say, you know? <laughs> Um, but watching it, actually watching it, I was, I was surprised by how much I said throughout the film. Um, and I was surprised by how much I could get across. Um, I think, like you said, I talked a lot about how you couldn't ignore who you are and about my identity and about you know, feeling, um, uh, I think there was one line where I said that when I was younger, I felt almost ashamed to be Mexican and that now I feel ashamed that I ever felt that way. And um, my Thea talked to me afterwards and was surprised that I had ever felt that way because she had felt that way growing up. And we didn't know that about, about each other. So, I think watching it together, we all realized um, what our identity means to us. And we also got to see, you know, the, the love story between my grandparents and um, some little moments of, from my, my tias and then my dad when they were younger. It's, it's, it's like a, um, what are those things called? Those time time capsule. It's like a time capsule, essentially. And so it was so nice just to to get to sit down and watch all of it and have that thing that we share together. Because you don't really think too much about your identity and how it bonds you with your family often. Um, but it is so bonding and it's really beautiful that you get to celebrate your culture together and you get to brave all of the challenges of your cultural identity together. Yeah, it, is, it wonderfully, you know, brings the parallels um, of experience between the generations together. And, um, mm -hmm. and it's also incredibly relatable as, a, as an audience um, member who, who watches it and sees a, a family um, facing, you know, family challenges and some extraordinary challenges of, of having bicultural backgrounds. Um, and, uh, and Trisha, you've made a film that is universal, universally relatable um, to its core, but will also, I think, speak to obviously many first, second generation Americans, um, whether they're you know, Latino or, or other. And um, I wonder if you can speak a little bit about who you do hope will, will encounter this film along the way, along its journey. We were very fortunate to have the film funded in part uh, by the National Endowment for Humanities and California Humanities. And part of working with them, you have to work with scholars. Um, it's a critical part of the grant uh, getting the grant is that you work with scholars and we work, work with five different scholars who are involved in education. And um, I think for me, the idea, I think the, the greatest red carpet was the red carpet um, that the Mejias created. For me, my hope is that the film will have its life more in the classroom, more around possibly public television, um, uh, to reach the specific audience that, as you say, Jesse, will relate to it and will create dialogue. Uh, one of our one of the advisors, um, she's a geographer and a human geographer around water. That was her, and the, really the way people left. Uh, 
Haltepec and left the Mishteka was essentially because of drought. And she now teaches at King's College in London. And she said she doesn't have any Latino kids in her classroom, but what she has is a lot of Pakistani kids and Bangladeshi kids. And she felt that her students would absolutely relate to this film, that whole thing of being it doesn't matter where you come from, um, but, you know, you move to live in a different country, not even the United States, but another country and or in France, how you relate, how you grow up in this culture where there's a different language, there are different customs, etc. So I really hope that the film has a big life in that way. And we're working with this organization, Cinema Tropical, based in New York, um, who specialize in making sure uh, Latino films reach the audience that is important to them. So we just started to do that. And, uh, and that's really... That's really our goal for the film is that we get it we get it into public libraries, into high schools, into colleges, because I think Vanessa especially will be this character that other people can relate to. And then students in a classroom can talk exactly like you talk, Vanessa, about your experience. And that's about validation. And I think that's where I hope this film has its its biggest value, I guess. That's great. I, I also hope that, you know, educators um, of, you know, middle schools or junior highs or whatever age seems appropriate um, to receive it can, you know, share it with, um, um, you know, Caucasian audiences as well, because, you know, um, the experience, Vanessa, that you share in the film of um, that, that caused you to feel that resentment towards your own background um, is important for, you know, white kids to be exposed to, you know, and, and understand how that's hurtful and destabilizing. And uh, um, so there's a lot of value in that as well, I think. Um, I wonder, uh, th there's so many like wonderful moments in the film, uh, Trisha, that you capture. Um, and I'm particularly fond of the moment when um, Mercedes is, is um, buying marigolds for the ofrenda and um, she's educating the vendor about, you know, the flowers and what they're for. And then the vendor <laughs> informs that uh, the fragrance is no longer as strong as it once was because of, you know, genetics or, or how they're breeding them. And I thought that was a perfect metaphor for, you know, the dilution of tradition and um, memory. And, and I wonder if you could just comment on that scene or any others that were, that particularly stick out to you as well. Yes, that was hilarious, no? I mean, there she is telling the story of how um, the Sapasuche is, uh, um, it, it, it's to, I actually didn't even know that. I mean, I know because I live in Mexico City what flowers are sold during Dia de los Muertos at that time of year, but I didn't realize because it was because of the fragrance was meant to bring bring your dead home. I didn't know that. So I learned that from Mercedes in that scene. And then the guy turned, well, he can't pronounce Dia de los Muertos. And then he, and then after that, he says, oh, well, they don't smell anymore. <laughs> you know, it's just about the look. And, and that's the difference even when you go to a supermarket in the United States, you know, and all these very shiny apples and all of this, and they don't taste. They don't taste in the way if you go to a little market in Mexico, uh, things really you know have a very different kind of flavor and that's to do with mass farming mass production all the things you're saying so the irony of that was was, was great no it made me made us laugh and of course editing the film you see those scenes again and again and again and then you get your favorite scenes and, and uh and then you have to lose things of course you lose your darlings you know and that's that's really hard it's very hard to say goodbye to to certain things, but uh, I mean, it's the nature of making a film because we edited 
the, we got, we'd saved over the years, Sylvia Stevens, the director of the first film, had in her basement the boxes of all the first films on these really big tapes, you know. And so we shipped that to Mexico and then I carried them, them to the States in suitcases and uh, we got them transferred uh, in the US uh, to HD. And uh, so we edited from we had over 200 hours and you're editing it down to 90 minutes or whatever so you lose a lot but you know it's the nature of the beast yeah and those scenes that you you know obviously chose to leave in so wonderfully move you know make our allow our the ideas to you know coalesce and 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 we can um sort of um think artistically about the themes and concepts that the Mejia family are um, sharing. Uh, one Vanessa, of my favorite, sorry, one of my no. favorite scenes is when all the all of you are dressed up for this folklorica event and you're having your photo taken and then one kid says that she can see the mochila the knapsack and it's got the hello kitty knapsack. So here you ha and they take it out of the image. So you have this beautiful scene of this group of people dressed up uh, in folklorica uh, clothing and interrupting the scene. It's a similar kind of thing, but back to front. You have the, the backpack with Hello Kitty on it. So always kind of modernity and contemporary culture disrupts reality in the same way as everyone but you was on the roof trying to get onto Snapchat. It's the same thing, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Vanessa, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, uh, a little more about um, what it was like to visit um, Hotepeka the, the first time, um, excuse me, Hotepec, and um, visit your grandfather's, you know, home at, that he's built, as well as his place of birth. It, it seemed to have a really big impact on you, um, it, but especially experiencing it. Absolutely. Um... You know, when, when you move somewhere new, you leave things behind. Um, and I remember that my, my cousin in the film, he had said that my grandpa worked so hard to build this home and my grandma worked so hard to make this home and that, you know, year after year, people stop coming back to Haltepec. And if we don't come back, then it'll be forgotten and it, it won't have been for anything. And that really stayed with me because um, before this film, I had never been there. And I had no idea that they used to go and visit my grandpa's village every year. Um, I had only been to Mexico at all once before when I was 10 years old and we went to Mexico City. So, yeah, going there, it really, it really changed my life. It brought me closer to my family. And I learned so much more about them. And I, I really understood all of the sacrifices that they made. I really understood who they were as people, what they had gone through. Because you hear stories growing up of, you know, your grandparents crossing the border. My grandma, she was so young. And my grandpa, he followed his dad over here. Um, and he used to make coffees, he said. And, and things that didn't require his hands. And now I see him, all I know is he's so hardworking. You know, he, he's out there in the heat, in the cold, um, digging up the ground and, you know, taking down trees. Uh, so it's so interesting to see just how, how much things change. Um, I think too, I understood, uh, Seeing like all of the images of other uh, immigrants who are working in the field, like my grandma once did, uh, it's interesting because, you know, seeing the work that my grandpa does now, I never would have thought that he would have even wanted or ever did work in any kind of office type setting. So it really kind of showed too, just how because they immigrated, um, they had to go through these extra challenges that you know other people might not have to go through. And it's 
uh, an experience that a lot of people experience. They have to uh, go through these really tough jobs just to keep climbing up the ladder. Um, yeah. Yeah, it is. So it's it, really. It was really amazing. Oh, sorry. Sorry. No, sorry to interrupt you. I was just going to say it, it, it's it's obviously quite powerful to watch your family, you know, be connecting with that home, you know, for the first time and, and having those experiences it and allows us as the viewers to feel those emotions too and experience it. Um, uh, Trisha, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, the music in the film. And then of course, Vanessa, you, your musical family. Um, and um, Trisha, could you talk a little bit about that music? Cause it's really gorgeous. Thank you. Well, we, I always, um, not always, but I, my, I work with this composer, Jacobo Lieberman, and um, I think Hako does extraordinary work. And we, we didn't want to just put traditional uh, Mishtek Oaxacan bands in the film. We wanted to do something different that was kind of more lyrical and would kind of bring the two places together. I mean, we talked about many ideas, you know, having kind of American sounding music in the, in the beginning, in, 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 in Fresno and then switching and all these things. And then we kind of came to this conclusion and we worked with two composers this time. The other was uh, Andres Sanchez and, um, and Andres does the, did the music to the dance sequence when Noe, uh, Vanessa's brother, is uh, and his her sister uh, uh, in this practice dance practice. And we didn't use the music that they were listening to, not because of the rights issue, but because we wanted something that we could take further forward and then be be different during the journey. And then so we hear that we hear that song three times in the film, but variations on the same theme. And we wanted to keep the music minimal also because there's a lot of characters in this film. It's confusing. It was very, very difficult to figure out how to edit so it wasn't confusing. Who's who? And you've got lots of people on camera at the same time. So you want the music to not overwhelm what you're visually looking at. And then, of course, this family, I mean, I call them the Mexican Von Trapps. Um, they, 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 they are extraordinarily uh, talented family. I mean, Leo plays in a, in a trio all the time. Noe, Vanessa's father, uh, composes and plays music all the time. In the first film, they play together, the father and son. And, and so we wanted to showcase, I guess, their singing, which we do in that very touching graveyard scene, but also then take it to a different place with them singing something that was more American. So that's how the film, the film ends with the a cappella of all the girls singing together. Um, and uh, so we didn't want wall to wall music. We didn't want to overwhelm. Um, we try to create this balance, but also include them. And uh, hopefully, hopefully it works. Vanessa, I imagine your fa you and your, your sisters and your family sing together all the time. Is that, is that right? Absolutely. Um, I've personally been singing, my dad says, since before I could even talk. My dad, he's, he plays the guitar. He sings with my grandpa. Um, yeah, we're a really musical family, and especially me and my two sisters. Um, we, when we were younger, my dad, he taught us how to harmonize. And ever since then, I mean, we just, we sing all the time, um, anything, everything. <laughs> we love musicals. It's really, it's really nice, you know, the, the bond that we have. I think our singing and our, our music really brings us together because, Whenever we sing together, you know, there's just something special that you feel. It's it's beautiful to be able to create something. And I get to create music with really all of my family. So, yeah. Um, in the grave scene, um, it, was, it was interesting to have that filmed just because 
it's just what our family does, you know, and at restaurants or in birthdays, we sing happy birthday with harmonies and people will say, oh, that's so like, that's so interesting that your family does that. Um, and it is interesting, but it's, it's really beautiful. I'm really glad that we got to share that in the film as well. It's a great experience in the film. And, um, you know, it, it your family's, um, your family's, um, this building of tradition or creation of tradition comes through so clearly too, you know, with the, the giving out mm -hmm. of the balls and at the festival and, you know, and it, and it harkens back to something that um, your grandfather shares where you, you know, he, he, part of his philosophy is just to, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but live in the moment and, you know, just take the happy times to the grave with you. And, and that's one thing that I think everyone will take away from this film. Um, so I want to thank you both for um, bringing the film to the Minneapolis St. Paul International Film Festival and sharing your experiences with us. And um, I I'd love to leave it with you if you have any final thoughts, both Vanessa and Tricia. Vanessa, you go. All right. Well, um, you know, this whole experience was amazing. It, it brought me closer to my family and it, it made me just want to hold on to my roots that much harder and really shout out who I am to the world and not apologize about it. You know, Trisha talked about this kind of being a response to Trump and it is a it was also a response to those unkind comments for me as well and all of the unkind comments that you know Mexican people and Latinx people get just for wanting a better life just for um, trying to do better for themselves there's so many beautiful people who are just like me from different cultures as well and I just hope that they see this movie and they also feel empowered to remember how beautiful they are. And um, yeah, that's, that's all I could really want is for people to understand me and be able to understand themselves and others. Yeah, so thank you so much for sharing. <laughs> I think it's up to me to thank you uh, for sharing because we invaded your family. We invaded your lives as a crew. Um, we went into your bedrooms. We went into your closets. Um, and you were all incredibly gracious. Occasionally, we asked you to do something more than once. And so we didn't lose it. And, and your, family, your family are, are ordinary and extraordinary and that you trusted me and my crew and all of us um, to enter into your worlds is something very precious. And I just hope that um, the film honors you all because you deserve it. So thank you. And thank you, Minneapolis. I love this festival. I hate that we're doing this virtually and not in person. They're very special people, Vanessa. Um, I have been invited to this festival on several occasions now, and it's kind of a bit like going home. So thank you, Jesse. And please thank everybody, Susan, everyone at the festival for including Waha, California, The Return. Uh, we're really proud to be a part of it. Thank you. We're honored to share it. Thank you both for joining us today. Thank you.